Um, without, so I'm going to introduce the debate today. So the theme for today's debate is social and public, and it's moderated by our very own Dr. Simon O'Rafferty. So Simon, he works in UL, but he's also um, a researcher and a practitioner with over 15 years experience working on design for sustainability social and social innovation across multiple scales with national and local governments, multinationals and small businesses, NGOs and activists, and in urban and rural communities. He is currently a design research fellow with the Irish Environmental Protection Agency, exploring the role of design and co-design in complex policy and regulatory contexts. His current projects with the EPA span the design of public services that enable behaviour change to support the transition to a circular economy, co-creation, participatory and deliberative processes for sustainable communities and community well-being, Co um, community based interventions tackling food waste and household recycling, and behavioural trials for environmental behaviour change within public sector organisations. So he's doing a lot of work. Prior to joining the EPA, Simon worked with the UK, in the UK as a senior researcher at the Eco Design Centre in Wales, where he worked with colleagues to design support services and capacity building programmes for eco design industry and higher education. He was also co-director of Arc Lab, a design agency that worked with UK local authorities and communities on the co-design of local services, strategies and public engagements across topics such as sustainable mobility, social inclusion and social innovation. He was also co-founder of Think Arc, which was a design activist collective of designers, community activists and artists that developed creative interventions, encouraging people to interact with their cities in novel ways. So I'd like to welcome Simon and he's going to introduce the panellists for today's debate. Uh, so, th uh, thanks Maren. So, uh, welcome everybody. It, this is not the slightest bit intimidating. Um, but the, the topic for the debate um, is social and public. Uh, and I know in your booklets you all have the kind of the description that we sort of initially set out for, um, uh, for this debate. But really, I suppose what we're trying to do is, what we want to do is explore some of the, I suppose, emerging contexts of design practice and design research. Uh, particularly in relation to design in and with and for governments, in terms of design for policy making, policy delivery, politics, and maybe some issues to do with social impact. Um, I suppose just to, rather than just re reading the, the description that you have in your, in your booklet, I suppose the, the rationale for this topic and why we included this topic uh, in the debate Initially, it was just a response to the overall theme of the conference in terms of catalyst for change and what that might mean. Um, but it was also just a recognition of the kind of the recent kind of accelerate, ex uh, that's a, a catalyst metaphor, I suppose, but acceleration uh, of design practice within, uh, within government and within public sector organizations and just recognizing that there's, there's something happening there. We need to understand it a little bit more. Uh, and also just kind of reflecting on some of, I suppose, recent experiences around design practice and research in terms of uh, things that maybe worked and didn't work in kind of co-design and design for so, uh, social innovation. Um, for me, it was also just a recognition that there are a number of uh, researchers within the DRS community that have been producing research over the last number of years, kind of critically examining uh, design practice and design research within, uh, within these, these contexts uh, and kind of asking questions about what the implications are for, for designers, uh, for design practice and for design research. And some of it about, you know, considering issues around the role and positioning of design within uh, within these contexts, but also, also some, some of the researchers are kind of looking at the implications for the policy system itself in terms of interacting with design, and then issues around representation, equality, governance, democracy, uh, and all of these kind of issues that we have to be confronted with if we're uh, working in these environments, and obviously issues around social impact if you're designing policies, the kind of medium and long-term potential social impacts, either positive or negative that might, uh, that might occur. So we wanted to explore some of these issues <laughs> in, a very short period, in a very short period of time. Uh, and it's not really about an oppositional debate about two people arguing against each other, but it's really looking at these issues from slightly two, diff two slightly different and maybe artificial stances uh, in terms of design research outside of government and design practice within government. Um, and just maybe and understanding where those actually sometimes meet and interact uh, in, uh, in practice and work that we do. So to explore that, I'm delighted that we have uh, Ramia Maze, uh, who is the professor of uh, New Frontiers in Design in Alto, Alto University. 
and Andrea Sidmock, uh, who's the head of the one of her jobs is the head of the policy lab uh, as part of the government innovation group within the UK cabinet office. Uh, and I think both Ramya and um, Andrea themselves have been, for the last number of years, have been, you know, really acting as leaders uh, in terms of, as I suppose, shaping. Uh, uh, opportunities for design research and design practice within government and helping to create opportunities for practitioners and for researchers to do work in this kind of environment. So it's great to have both of them here. Um, I do also want to acknowledge, and it's something that we have discussed over the last uh, couple of months around, you know, in terms of looking at this, uh, this topic, uh, we have a very Northwest European uh, perspective uh, on the topic in terms of the speakers that we have. This is maybe something that we need to explore a little bit more uh, later on today. Um, and I'm not making excuses, but I take it as a, my personal responsibility because the two people who uh, I wanted from outside of Europe basically couldn't make it, uh, working in design in government. I'm not making excuses, but again, we just have to recognize this, this is something that we're aware of and we, we, uh, we acknowledge it. So, uh, the format for today uh, it's quite similar to yesterday, so both Ramya and Andrea will have between five and ten minutes, or maybe ten minutes, uh, to make a kind of an opening statement in terms of setting the context of their work and what they're doing. Uh, I will then lead out with a couple of questions, some to do with maybe the, the context of design uh, within, you know, within government, uh, maybe some of the issues around design practice and design education and research, but I'll also be weaving in uh, the questions from Slido. Um, which I have here, so I have to try and make sure I'm listening while reading Slido. Uh, but I also know, I'm also aware some people might want to use Twitter, so I'll have Twitter open as well. So if people want to propose questions on Twitter, I'll also be trying to uh, uh, take questions um, uh, from Twitter. So, so the only thing I, need, I just need to say, I suppose, be, and I hope you don't I hope you don't mind me, me saying it, Andrea. So and, Andrea is tech, you're, you're, you are a civil servant, uh, so Andrea will, will actually be bound by the civil service code. Uh, so, depending on, on the questions that appear, we might have to think about how, uh, I suppose, Andrew's position in terms of being able to answer them or not. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you. So, so without further ado, I'd like to invite both of you to the stage, please. Thanks. Thank you. So, in terms of in terms of, in terms of order, we're going to go for my right. Uh, to the left, um, and I suppose Andrea or uh, uh, Rama, you, you, you could start with your uh, opening position, if that's okay. Very good, thank you, Simon. Yes. So, in my experience, design is enmeshed all the time in power relations and hegemonies, political regimes, and ideologies. This is something my early education in architecture uh, taught me to analyze alongside creative, aesthetic, and technical aspects of practice. It's something I found lacking in my subsequent design, education, and practice. And perhaps this isn't surprising. Architecture has long dealt with public space uh, and been employed by monarchs uh, and the state. We've long understood that architecture can do the work of police and military. Consider Haussmann's urban plan for Napoleon III that inserted grand boulevards in Paris to better survey the population and suppress revolution. Or a more contemporary example, Mike Davis's Fortress LA. Architecture can enforce political ideologies in lasting material forms. Consider Robert Moses' racial class basis for infrastructure in New York City, and many other, too many other similar examples. While different from architecture, in many and important ways, design is also political. While architecture exerts power through physical means, boulevards and borders for surveillance and control, uh, architecture uh, designed tools, toolkits, interactions, routines, networks, programs, games, algorithms, etc., etc., exert more subtle but effective forms of regulatory and what I would call biopolitical power. This example from Luisa Prado's doctoral research makes the point. 
In 1961, within her research, she traces engineer David Wagner's um, design of the round package, still ubiquitous today, that mimicked a calendar for his wife to track her intake of birth control pills. Prado articulates how this uh, packages embody patriarchal anxiety about women's ability to manage their own fertility. Further developing philosopher Paul Preciado's analysis of the pill package as an apparatus of biopolitical self-surveillance and quote-unquote edible panopticon, referring to Foucault's theorization of surveillance architecture. In delegating control or governance over individual conduct, as in this example, to a non-human actor, here a package, in other cases, perhaps a healthcare provider, design effectively creates, quote unquote, according in uh, Louisa's research, actors ontologically designed to comply. Arguably, design as governing behavior always has political implications. This is evident and even intentional in persuasive design, design for behavior change, as some of my early work in the design research program Static and Switch has explored in energy consumption. And in the area of design for policy, design doing governance is also explicit, as Jocelyn Bailey somewhere here uh, investigates in her doctoral research, and I paraphrase her. Design practices as applied in government are concerned with generating new devices of governing, for example, chatbots to lead you through your visa or asylum application. New ways of being a civil servant, for example, design games, co-design methodologies. And new ways of being a citizen, for example, co-production or participation in service uh, design or delivery especially where explicitly used for behavior change, designed is concerned with and indeed promises and provides tools for the conduct of the self, self-governance. This can be seen as an example of governmentality in action, the conduct of conduct. Design provides new understandings of and capacities to manipulate the interface between the personal and the state. Today, it is design, perhaps more than architecture, that is being called upon by governments. This EC action plan frames the task of design to drive renewal in the public sector and modernization of public administration. And Design for Europe, which carries out the action plan, highlights Finland and the course for which I've been responsible with Sung Ho Lee and a great teaching team at Aalto University. The political task of design is rapidly expanding in important examples such as the UK Policy Lab, which we'll hear a lot more about, and many other labs, as well as embedded designers in government, such as Simon. As several design theorists have observed, design has thrived with the rise of neoliberal forms of governance in the EC directive entering government through the Trojan horse of innovation. Design is well suited to the diffusion of neoliberal and market logics in our societies and in our lives. Beside long-standing roles of design in governing bodies and behaviors, the political role of design has expanded categorically as designers and design today operate within governmental institutions. But what's at stake is much more than new job opportunities or yet another domain for practice. And unfortunately, design theory is struggling to keep pace with the rapid expansion in practice. Daniel Lopazo, Matias Wolf, and Maria Jose Araya have recently problematized our preoccupation in design and design research with questions of how and what, the process and the outcome. They interrogate instead the political situation of design, engaging with particular political theories in order to position, conduct, and analyze their participatory and public space projects in Chile. They focus upstream of how and what, on what I would call why, or the political rationales conditioning design. Why, for me, is a critical question, and it's one of the 
kinds of critical questions that I've been preoccupied with together with uh, in a pilot this spring with Jocelyn Bailey, Eva Berglund, Maria Ferreira Lithochenko, Guy Julier, Lucy Kimball, Min Lei, Charlie Meelings, Afra, and an increasing number of design researchers and researchers in political administration on this topic. Why interrogants, uh, interrogating why design is called upon, why design emerges in, gover in governance, may help us grasp the rationales and political situations into which design is called. And there are many calls or types of calls for design. Some invoke innovation or efficiency, which in a European context resonates with austerity rationales and programs of management reform, reorganization and redistribution. Other calls evoke complexity and wickedness or uncertainty and experimentation. Participation is also a door through which design enters, but there are many kinds of rationales at play within calls for participation. It may be framed in terms of restoring public trust in perhaps a rather superficial way, retaining top-down logics. It may be framed in terms of strong democracy, citizen participation, and public deliberation, but often this is incompatible with rationales of efficiency and expertise. Nor may deliberation change the ground rules for debate, power dynamics, and predefined relevant people and publics in the issue. So why does why matter? And I believe there are several reasons. Different rationales indicate different political situations and conditions that we enter into and under which we therefore agree to design. Different whys imply different hows and whats, even different kinds of design. Is the call for design thinking, strategic design, service design, co-design, transition design, systems design, game design, blah, blah, blah. Design is never the only or even the best possible how or what. We must consider the scope and the limits of design. In design for policy, we're elbow to elbow with digital, behavioral sciences, who are experts on efficiency and leverage, all those working with agile and AI everything. Other disciplines and practices are rapidly absorbing design thinking and skills. And while we have and need plenty of design, including the kind of design that anyone can do, we also and increasingly need critically and politically situated design. And this is what I argue we should be leading in design research. To conclude with one of the starting points uh, uh, for Camilla Anderson's doctoral research that makes the point. Uh, Sweden's national equity policy uh, here on the screen is the frame for her Vinova funded, it's a Swedish governmental uh, funder uh, in, for innovation systems through which she and her team were funded. The project team revisited basic assumptions such as innovation, progress and technology in terms of the kind of rationales within this governmental and the Vinova uh, uh, discourse. The project team looked at innovation, progress and innovation in terms of a history of ideas that's predominantly male and Western suprematist, following Sandra Harding, a post-colonial STS scholar. And they reframed their terms and methodologies accordingly and critically to a research context of health and elderly care within regions and municipalities um, rethinking actually what innovation, what the rationales and logics of innovation should be within a socioeconomically strained and female and immigrant dominated sector. So re asking why and where the call for design comes from, regardless of the rationale or the actual government in power as a starting point for both research and practice is how I'd like to position myself. Fantastic, thank you very much. Thank you, Ramya and Andrea. Good morning. Um, it's fantastic to hear Ramya mention some of the work that the European Commission did. And, and Rachel and I spent 18 months uh, with the Commission trying to understand the role that design might play um, on a broader stage. Um, and I think quite a number of those months were spent asking the question, what is design? Mm. And uh, it was quite interesting and a, a probably a useful starting point to just make the point that design comes in so many different guises. Yes. 
And so for me, it's been about uh, finding, exactly as Rama, Ramia said, uh, where are the limits of design? Oh. Are there limits of design? And how do different contexts shape design? And how does design shape different contexts? So back in 2001, I gave a keynote in Seoul about, uh, entitled Beyond the Bauhaus, which was about moving from a mechanistic worldview into uh, a future worldview that took account of a lot of contradictions that we see in the broader context, whether it's political, environmental, sociological change. So from that point of view, I was interested in how design might uh, move from design of detail, design of form, into the design of services and processes, and then beyond into the design of policy or the context. Uh, and, and really, over the last 20 years, which pretty much since I, I last was at the DRS uh, in the mid-90s, um, I've been exploring that in one way or another. Um, initially at the Design Council through running and developing their challenge program, and then more recently in the UK government uh, at the Policy Lab. So um, I put this set of words on uh, to kick off, really, with a, with a question, which is, where is design? Um, if we talk about public, social, and governmental application of design, where does design fit? So if there's a theme that I'm going to talk about throughout the slides, it's really about that adaptation of design and uh, how it fits within what is already quite a complex system, as Ramia said, around uh, behavioral insights, economics, and other dominant professions which occupy this space. A living experience, when I, when I joined government, I had to um, do a drop-down menu and choose my profession. And uh, I, I found on the list actuaries, uh, but I didn't find designers. Um, and so actuaries uh, measure risk. They analyze risk. And yet design has a powerful way of unearthing where risks may lie, uh, but it, it wasn't uh, one of the drop-down menus. So um, design uh, in the context of government, I think, fits within both the political, the art of politics, the craft of policy making, the science of management, uh, new public management uh, over many decades, and into also the pragmatics of delivery. And for me, if, if nothing else you take from this, it is the role of design as an enabler of the stepping between strategy and delivery, or ideas and implementation, uh, uh, bridging that gap that is often very difficult for organizations to do, um, is very important and a role for design. Incidentally, the Cabinet Office, uh, for the first time, has the word design in its objectives. We have three objectives at the Cabinet Office in the UK government, and the, the word design appears in there for the first time. Um, this is our team. Uh, this is based in the Sky Room, which is um, in the Treasury. Uh, it overlooks Big Ben. To give you a bit of geography, if you looked out the window of this room, you would see Big Ben. Well, you wouldn't. You're covered in scaffolding. Uh, but when we built the room, you could see Big Ben. Um, and just to make the point that our team is very diverse, so we have one service designer who also has a master's in public policy. I trained as an industrial designer and um, have done my master's in, in um, policy and economics at the London School of Economics and my PhD in digital. Um, <coughs> here, for example, uh, some of the people who've worked with the lab, um, our team is only eight people, so the people in the picture are an extended team, but it includes people like Jay Paul, who we work with on some of our speculative design work. Um, it includes people from all around the world, so that we, we second in people most recently from uh, Peru, from uh, Australia, New Zealand. So a real mix, so addressing that kind of Western, Northwestern centricism. Um, that's probably not the case in the lab. Um, we have two ethnographers. Oh. Um, we also have researchers. And, and of course, fundamental to our effectiveness in government has been the uh, leadership of policy officials. So the lab itself is not led by design. It's led by policy experts. And we apply design. And we apply three Ds, design, digital, and data science. Oh. Uh, so we are, um, we, we, we utilize all, all number of different tools and methods, and you can see those on the Open Policy Making Toolkit. Um, so one of the things that one of our designers who came from the uh, Royal Society of Arts um, Design Prize, a student who joined us, what she wanted to do is really map the world of policy. So she started by uh, mapping what happens if you write a letter to your MP. 
where does that go? How many touch points within the system? And this uh, it's not public yet. Um, obviously, you can see it. Um, but um, there's a video that flies through the, the journey of a, of a letter. And it starts to unfold the sheer amount of complexity that policymakers have to deal with. In the UK government, there are 20,000 policymakers, to give you a sense of scale. Um, and at any one time, maybe 200 priorities of government, everything you know, from space security to social housing and, uh, and many others. For me, the role of design, the role of policy are actually quite similar. <coughs> they both uh, look at a range of different elements and have a, a process of synthesis. And they also both utilize uh, the power of modeling. Um, but it's about choices. So this photo I took in Soho in, uh, in, in London. And um, you can see here three parking spaces. The first one um, says doctor. The, the second one says disabled. I'm not sure if you can read the third one. What does the third one say? So th this is pr prime London parking space. <laughs> And uh, you know, to get a space here is, is really hard. Uh, so we've had to make decisions as a society about who gets the third space. So um, if you're a taxi in this space, you can do, you have slightly different rules, but no, it's not delivery. Or delivery, did you say? Um, it is electric. So, um, it's, it, it's one of many examples where government has to make a choice. It has to make a trade-off yeah. between priorities of different constituents. And in this case, if you're disabled, if you're a doctor, or if you're driving an electric vehicle, you are the same in parking terms. Um, if, obviously, if you are a disabled doctor driving an electric vehicle, <laughs> you've, you've, got, you've got free reign. Um, but who's to say that we should uh, favour one group of people mm. over another? And these are, these are power choices. Um, this is some of the work that we've been doing, and I won't explain in detail, but um, the Policy Lab does uh, around 10 projects a year for the Prime Minister and government departments. To date, we're, we're five years old, so we've done, we've done around 40 projects. Um, we work on uh, social issues using the ethnography, but we also, uh, for example, at the moment, um, things like digital forensics, uh, cybersecurity and uh, space security, uh, marine autonomy. Uh, we've heard of autonomous cars, uh, well, um, there's also shipping that contains that same kind of AI technology. And so we've been working uh, on that. So a real breadth of topics, and so far I've found no limits. Um, but um, this is some work we did on the future of ageing. We're working with uh, the Department for Bays on the industrial strategy and uh, ageing grand challenges. And here we were looking at what the future looks like. And this has all come out of evidence. So a 200,000 word report was written. And these visualizations uh, are evidenced directly from that report data. So you could read the report, or you could put the speculation in the world and, in and uh, get in feedback from citizens in how they feel about that world. I always tell the example when we were in Manchester, those of you who know uh, Manchester, um, they said it must be the future when they saw the visualization, uh, because it's not raining, and uh, therefore global warming must have happened. Um, and actually, it was just really hard to render rain in the, in the visualization, so it was a bit of a design quirk. Um, what we've also been doing, and one of the things I wanted to finish with, um, was um, mapping the way that policymakers exert their influence. And again, as I said, design and policymakers both share the tool of mapping as well as the tools of synthesis. And so um, we've been developing, this is the marine autonomy. So this is everyone um, in a room talking about the next 30 years of shipping. So it would be the insurers, <coughs> it would be the uh, ship builders, it would be the um, freight companies, everybody. Um, and we use this thing called um, 28 levers for change. Um, 28 levers for change we developed in the policy lab really to help people navigate the future. Um, I like a nice, simple diagram. So, um, so this is the 28 levers for change. And you can see on it, um, on the left-hand side, there are, there are various levels of change, some of which are more traditional policy making. And these tend to be quite slow. So making laws takes, uh, takes quite a long time. Um, and the world, as won't have escaped you, moves quite quickly. So one of the things that we've sought to do with this mapping of the landscape is to find ways that government can operate systemically 
working with others to get things done in a way that utilises the full range of possibilities. And, and government often works in many of these boxes. So you'll see on here, for example, the convening power, where your president or your prime minister stands on the steps of their, of their residence, and they're able to make stuff happen just by saying it. And that's a really powerful role that obviously states and leaders use. Um, right the way through uh, to choice architecture of behavioural insights and so on. Uh, the role of government as a procurer, the role of government as um, an innovator and as a reformer is also in there. So we've turned this into the toolkit that you see there where actually in workshops people can start to say, well, how might design, how might um, we use these powers in new ways? So for us, uh, it's a common ground where we're starting to look at the different ways that um, government might operate and how design might enable that. Um, we um, are constantly evolving and I think the beauty of design in the sort of 20 odd years that I've been working in it is its ability to evolve and not be bound by last year's uh, thinking or last year's tools or last year's uh, ways of working and, and I think that for me, design is, the power of design is its ability to redesign and reform its own practice. And in, in doing so, that's why I love my job. I mean, I got into design because I wanted to make a difference to people's lives. And I found in central government uh, a, an entirely new space to start to do, to do that and to also be accountable for the outcomes of citizens. Um, so it's been, it's been an amazing uh, space to experiment and uh, we're just in the foothills of doing that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. So, I, I promise I have been listening, uh, but I've also been trying to read Slido and Twitter at the same time. So there's a lot of interesting questions coming in and, and we'll hopefully get to, to maybe group some of them together and, and address them all. So there's a couple of questions coming in um, around issues to do with the decolonization of design, those kind of issues that we've been discussing a lot, uh, issues around the kind of the, the position of the designer as a as a neutral uh, in, as a neutral individual within the policy context and the politics ar around that that we have to deal with. Um, and there's been some interesting questions just to do with complexity and the kind of the structural changes that are happening around policy and how we have to maybe consider that and understand that as uh, as designers. Uh, but I, to, I just wanted to pick, there was a few threads between both of your presentations and it kind of linked in with actually my first kind of question, which is something that I still haven't really, really been able to answer. Um, but policy design as a, as a practice and as a, uh, a practice in government and as a topic of research has been around for many, many decades, uh, mainly in the political sciences. And so that, that terminology of designing policies has been around for a very long time. But the way we, you know, in terms of us, the way we discuss it in terms of design within policy is quite a new entrant into the field of government uh, uh, and in, uh, in policy. And there's a lot of critical papers within political science almost saying, who, who, are, you to who are you to come in here and start you know, design, using design in government uh, without the kind of historical context and understanding of power structures and that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to kind of just to, just to tease out a little bit about what your perspectives are on why is this happening now? And is it, you know, the supply side in terms of designers going into government trying to make change happen? Or is there something about the demand uh, from government for I uh, suppose, new ways of, of approaching design and what's maybe driving that, whether some structural issues or uh, other, you know, uh, other more immediate concerns around experimentation and new ways of developing policy. That's a very long question, but I'm just wondering if you could just, just to kind of explore a little bit more about why is this stuff happening now and where, where might, might it go? Shall I start? Mm -hmm. I'm not a historian. Uh, I wish I was, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think design emerges, and anyway, it looks very different in different fields and in different parts of the world. I mean, there are fields called policy design. The, uh, in the EU funding program, the word design is mentioned five times under the ERC category, one of which is pharmaceutical design, one out of five. So there are many very open uses of the term design. It looks very different in different places, in different languages, speaking of the decolonization and so on. Um, 
I mean, the, the trajectory that I traced from architecture as an instrument of power to design as an instrument of power has been written quite a lot about in terms of how uh, types and forms of government need different instruments for uh, uh, managing populations. And again, my definition of political is basically how society is constituted and, and organized, a very broad. So many governments do the political in many different ways. And while in previous centuries, say, 500 years ago, it was through hard power, it was through warfare, it was through military, it was through war, ball, war, uh, border walls, um, it was through hard uh, mechanisms. And in the last 200 years with the rise of uh, liberal uh, forms of governance and now new neoliberal forms of governance, those instruments, those regulatory mechanisms have softened. And design, I, I believe, and it's been well argued, is particularly able to operate at the kind of in these soft power uh, ways and in the soft spaces through which uh, the state communicates with the individual and regulates everyday life, uh, community behavior, uh, law and order, but in much softer ways than previously. And then, of course, these kind of languages of innovation is very close to design. That is, as I see, and has been traced actually by design historian, dean of our school, Anna Maltonen, as the way through which design has risen up into the top echelons of uh, both funding regime, funding and but also political power. Um, I think that, this, you know, as, as we've said, the design takes many forms. Um, there has been a rush of design, if you like, um, with the digitization yeah. uh, and digital agenda. There are genuinely hundreds of designers in the UK government doing digital roles and uh, many, many more um, doing service design. But I, but I remember distinctly mid-2000s, people mm. saying service design didn't exist. And, and in a way, that kind of makes the point that I wanted to make about mm. the fact that these are quite emergent disciplines, both for design. Um, but I think that one of the things I've learned from my experiment of putting myself as a designer into a government setting um, is the importance of humility. Um, there is always the hubris around the fact that design is some kind of s solution to everything, uh, including solutions, um, and, and actually, I've, I've needed to up my game in terms of my ability to present concrete evidence. Mm. Um, the, the standard of evidence in government is higher than anywhere I've ever worked in the private sector or um, outside of government. And um, we've had to make design more rigorous as a result. And, and in doing that, we've had to embrace uh, big data um, in order to give us more of a context of what is happening uh, at scale so we know how many millions of people might be affected by a policy, um, and then also utilising thick data of ethnography in order to tell us why it's happening. But the gap, and the thing that I've written about in, in many of my PowerPoints, the diagram I didn't um, share today, is once you know that, once you've established what it is you're trying, what the context is, what are you going to do about it? And it's moving that into practical action where the design skill set really comes um, into the fore. So whether it's digital, developing new services that are more citizen-centered, or whether it's a more a policy about, well, what are we going to do about homelessness? Um, or what are we going to do um, in the future in response to the technologies like AI and blockchain? Um, and these, this, this is the space where designers are very comfortable. They're comfortable with ambiguity, they're comfortable with complexity, um, and they can um, tune in to the needs and behaviors and sens sensibilities of uh, of other people um, and we've always been described as kind of a breath of fresh air from that point of view but does, I never really talk about design um, oh. and so uh, we talk about what needs to be done mm -hmm. and how might we utilize a range of different uh, disciplines professionals in order to get that done oh. um, and therefore as a consequence design has to be a little bit more humble I like the phrase humble. It's obviously very important. Obviously, it'd be my own practice being within government and deal, uh, mm. dealing with people who are experts in environmental policy and regulation and you know, trying to understand what my role It goes both is. ways. The experts have to be more humble too because the thing that drives a lot of this is the promise of co-design and, and enabling citizens to have greater voice. Um, 
And so on our social housing work, we have gone out and spent time with a thousand citizens who are tenants of housing um, and get their voice directly and their ideas. Um, and that, that's unusual yeah. for government. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting that you don't use the word design. I think that's, that's really telling also as well. And you speak instead in, in terms of goal or what's in common, what's, what's the aim. Uh, and I think it's useful to anyway start naming a, a, what is it that design does in a way that also helps differentiate from what does ethnography do? Uh, what does uh, uh, the AI, the data do? Um, and I, I think this maybe this humility is is also something to highlight. It's it's very challenging to our traditional paradigms of the designer in our education and so on. Humility. Um, also, in in our audience is Mariana Amatula, whose doctoral thesis um, identified different kind of design attitudes or capabilities. And I think that's also a useful way. And ambiguity is one of them. So these ways that we are trained, whether or not we work in design or call ourselves a designer, are very useful to put words on in a way. Uh, and I think this kind of ambiguity, working with ambiguity, complexity, and perhaps I'd be very happy to add the term humility, um, and finding one's own, own limits as something that designers are capable of doing. Mm. I mean, when I, I spoke to um, a colleague in government who was very senior, and I asked them the question, what do you think design brings? Um, they, they were really clear, and they said it's optimism. It's mm. this kind of relentless optimism that we can do better and that the future can be better, and that that positive energy is a driver of change as opposed to um, you know, other forces for change which may be more negative. So mm -hmm. um, it's often the case that others can see the value in design, that designers are just, you know, classic as a McLuhan said, fish would never invent water. Mm. You know, when you're in it, you can't see it. Um, so sometimes one of the things that I think we found in the, as a uh, design team within government was that um, we wouldn't state the obvious, uh, what was obvious to us, and we needed to get better at simplifying the message, taking away the jargon, um, the amount of people I meet who really trip up on words like ethnography um, and it, it puts everyone back in their silos, their professional silos and our, our work is all about getting rid of that complexity, get, making things um, understandable because if, if it's complex and citizens really find it much harder to engage with. So for us, uh, simplifying the language, getting rid of all the, the sort of um, unnecessary jargon is, is crucial to being able to talk about it. Can I, can I just pick up on something? There's something, and I, I, again, I don't want to just drive my own interest in the, in the, in the discussion, but there's, there's something that you've both mentioned around kind of evidence and knowledge and the different types of knowledge that might be generated by design. And I suppose my experience is that, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's true or not, but it seems that evidence is what, you know, is the kind of part of the oil of, of policy and, you know, the importance of evidence because of ensuring public value, not causing social harm and those kind of, kind, of, kind of issues. And then just thinking about some of the questions that people are asking about the position of design within that and the types of knowledge that's being produced by designers w working within government and you know, recognizing that maybe they're potentially causing harm and understanding their own biases or maybe not understanding how the, the knowledge that they're producing might be used by the political process or political mechanism. But is there just some way you can just, just talk a little bit about you know, the types of knowledge that you see are being generated in design and how they help or not? Um, I think one of the, uh, so, so we do, we use design in lots of different ways. So like the mapping that you saw, um, often policymakers find the aesthetics of design a, a really important and powerful um, added value. Um, and, it, and one of the dilemmas, if you like, that we have in terms of knowledge production is that there is a, a pre-existing way of communicating within government that follows the briefing. And the briefing might be a one or two page synopsis of something that's hugely complicated. So imagine the most complicated thing you can think of. How can you make that a two page artifact that can be uh, shared with a minister? Um, that's, that concision is an incredible skill. It's a synthesis and it's a concision. Well, design has that, um, but it's very rare for images to make it into, into those kind of briefings or even into the, into the PowerPoint packs. So um, often the case, 
I have to make judgments all the time between do I do, I do this in words or do I do it in images uh, or diagrams or, or photographs? Um, and they definitely, as different forms of knowledge, land in very different ways uh, within a political system. Is there something about prototyping? You know, because I know, say, Lucy Kimball's work, she's exploring kind of you know, the role of prototypes within the policy system. Is there something around that as a specific oh. type of design-related knowledge that you've kind of you've seen has some influence or, or not within the policy system? Mm. Um, I think I, I, now I'm caught up on the word prototyping. That was part of my question because sometimes Sorry. we get yeah. fixated <laughs> on the prototype. But the, anyway, yeah. so that's no, we, we did actually. It was quite one of the things that we said is so how do we know that we're actually having an impact in it? What is a system of 400,000 people, that's just the civil service. Um, and we said the word prototyping wasn't being used in government uh, four years ago, oh. not, not very much, if at all. Um, and we would therefore track the use of a word like prototyping uh, to see how mainstream that had become. Um, we prototype all the time. Um, and then on those prototypes, we have to say, this is not official government policy, because it's a little bit like um, the War of the Worlds yeah. radio broadcast, where if you make it so believable, people believe it's a real thing. So we prototype new letters, we tr prototype nice. new ways that the private rental system might work, gloves that you might wear if you were um, protecting a crime scene and you're the police uh, and you have to turn off your mobile phone so that you don't, your data, your mobile phone doesn't, in, doesn't corrupt the crime scene. Um, we, we designed some gloves that would rem give you a checklist reminder. Very simple prototype. But of course, um, they're so believable yes. that people think they're real policy. So we, we've had to kind of carry out some of that. I think this is a really interesting point because this is besides attitude I, I, or capabilities, design uh, produces and expresses knowledge in very different ways. And I think the materiality that you talked about, the choice between words, images, diagrams, and photographs is something we know a lot about, but we know very little about what that does within uh, collaborative processes, within uh, behavioral change, within persuasion of different types of people. And I think that's one of, besides the question why, I think uh, follow the materialities would be a really important way of kind of uh, tracking what, how design knowledge appears, is produced, and then has tangible effects, perhaps in different ways than other forms of expression do. I think that's really, really important. Um, and then I think thinking about your question about risk, like what actually happens with those. Um, you make choices, what happens to that? I would love to study that. <laughs> and we should all be looking at that. Um, and then the question is, how do you assess what risks or uh, that might have or what impacts, that actually is something that I think we have not prepared designers to think about properly in education. Um, in architectural education, because of the legal standing of the architect, it's basically accountability, both legally and in terms of insurance claims, um, have to account for the building continues to remain standing um, and different kind of uh, very specific uh, definitions of the response responsibility for architecture after it's been built. And I think that kind of thinking about in, including uh, the, the procedures, the, the codes, the legal and, uh, and other kinds of harms that can be caused is part of many professional educations, medicine, law, architecture, and not yet part of design. I mean, we had a very brief discussion yesterday actually about, about this in terms of, uh, I suppose my understanding was we need to think about the kind of ethics of design and you sort of said, well, ethics is kind of usually a kind of a binary, is it good or bad? Whereas actually what you're saying is understanding the politics and maybe implications of the knowledge that you create within the particular political system that you're working within. Oh. And it just, you know, it's, it's, again, maybe that's a very 